love will protect. Love always hopes, love still believes when you don't. Love is the arms that are holding you. Love never fails you. Yeah, Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, open. And let us begin. How many of you think you're a pretty good singer? Now, I will not call you up at this moment, and I will not call you up today without your permission. But if you think you can carry a tune pretty well, would you raise your hand? Don't be afraid. If you think you can carry a tune pretty well. Okay. Of you who raise your hand... Is there anybody here who figures you might have perfect pitch? Anybody? Alexis, you think you might have perfect pitch? It's a good thing that I said I would ask permission because I'd bring you up and I'd test that. I have a friend who, uh, his name is Greg Brayton. He's a worship leader in Coldwater, Michigan, my hometown. And Greg is blind. He's been blind since he was eight months old. And he has something very close to perfect pitch. They have different terminology for it in the blind world. One day I was playing a recording for a fella in college, way back when I was in college, which was in the late 70s, in my undergrad degree. And I was so proud of my buddy who was playing with a rock band, Blind Man's Bluff, a phenomenal lead guitarist, not necessarily the greatest singer in the world, but he had written a bunch of originals in this band that played the club circuit. They were in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and we went to see them, and I recorded them, and I was playing the recording for a friend, and this friend in the dorm said, well, he sings flat, and I go, no, he doesn't. He's got perfect pitch. He says, well, he may have perfect pitch, but it's flat, and I listened really close, and you know what? It was a little off. When I'm in the studio recording with Greg through the years, I might think that I've done a really good job, and then he'll push the little button in the control room and say, Ah, buddy, I think we could do that last phrase again. And I say, Oh, yeah, really? He goes, Yeah, we were having a little bit of pitch problems. And I grew to not be upset with somebody pointing out my flaw. Why? Because he was on my side, serving in the role of producer. I didn't know that I had sung a little off pitch, but I relied on his ear more perfect than mine. Today we're going to discuss perfection and music. We're going to discuss the vigor of youth. That's why we want the children to stay in with us today. Children, you see the guitar held up on the screen where it says strength. There's a guitar held up. That's to represent everybody under 12. You guys are the future, the strength. I mean, by the time 13, 14, it's all downhill from there. You've got the most energy When you're 9, 10, 11, 12, you hit your prime maybe at 12, and then it's going down. The brain starts to go down. And believe me, this I don't know if it's scientifically proven, but I think that kids tend to get stupid when they hit their teenage years. 
I mean, when a child gets saved at the age of eight, I tell that child, you know, you're smarter today than you might be when you're 17. Because today, you gave your life to Jesus Christ. You want to be baptized. You want to live for Jesus. When you're 17, you might not be as interested in serving the Lord with your whole heart. There's a variety of reasons for that. Last week, we had our mind stretched. At Bell Road Baptist Church, there is supposed to be one mind. There is supposed to be one voice. There is one gospel, one baptism, one faith. We are to have the mind of Christ. We participate with Christ, doing things his way. I saw the the hymnal up on the screen today, and it said, um, Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. You recognize the old tune? Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed thy. Okay, hold on a second. Too much. All I have needed thy. Just give me one word. Thy. Hand singular. But our worship leader was saying hands. Did you catch that? Anybody catch it? Now, um, buddy, uh, could we sing that last phrase over again? Huh? Yeah, you kind of went off the page, man. What? It's supposed to be hand, singular. Ah. Oh. Now, if we were an argumentative person, we'd go, well, of course the Lord has two hands. But as I sat out there, I thought, how many hands does God have? Well, he's got an ever-reaching stretch, yes. I think if you count how many hands you've got attached to your body, there's two. Look at the person next to you. How many hands over there? Two. There's four. How about on the other side? How many hands? Two. That's six. Do you know your math? Jesus has a whole lot of hands, doesn't he? That's why we want to have our mind stretch. But how many minds does Jesus have? One. See, he lets us extend our arms and walk with our feet. Many, many times, many ways. A lot of diversity there. But there's only one mind. It's not a divided mind. There's only one mind of Christ. And we had to stretch our minds in order to let his mind at Bell Road Baptist Church be stretched in our problem solving. Now this becomes very practical in the weeks ahead. As we consider do's and don'ts for Bell Road. Tim, will that? I didn't ask your permission, but I believe you will cooperate. Would you open your bulletins? Tim wasn't here last week, and so we replaced him last week, you know? He wasn't here, didn't call in, say, oh, by the way, I won't be here. You're gonna, I found a replacement. He didn't do any of that, left me hanging. I didn't want to look stupid with a bulletin, said Tim will let, Tim, where are you, Tim? Uh, I think he's in Colorado. So we got Kurt Harjo, and Kurt came up right on cue. But you know what happened this morning? Kurt came up to me and said, okay, is there anything I need to know about the announcements? I said, what? He pointed in the bulletin that he was up. And I go, I'm sorry, Kurt, that's a mistake. It's a remnant of last week's glory day. He says, is Tim here? I don't see Tim. Well, I thought he should be here, but I asked one of his sons. I said, yeah, he's here. I said, okay, well, Tim's up. We're putting Tim in today. Thanks, Tim. Oh, but Tim, during vacation Bible school, you came to see me And you said, there's too much getting up and down, too much uh, loose behavior in the sanctuary during the sermon. Too many people walking around in the halls. Just wondering how safe that is as well, is how good and healthy it is for the body of Christ if God wants to speak to us through a psalm, hymn, a spiritual song, or through the word of God as it's read publicly, as it's preached, as it is taught. And so I asked him, would you be willing to serve as a head usher. Now, I know I might be offending nominating committee folk, you know, from here on out. Uh, But I just thought, in the meantime, until a nominating committee decides, you know, to go and canvass the people, that I thought it would be all right, folks. Tell me if I'm wrong. But I thought it'd be all right if I would ask Tim, he saw a need, if he would fill in alongside Kurt Harjo, our problem-solving deacon, who is also going out doing security. He's locking doors. Why? Because if somebody slips out, 
there's not much, pl- there are not many places for him to go except in the bathroom. The doors are locked outside. But besides that, it helps to cut down on the trouble that children might run into. So, Tim, I wonder if today we haven't really figured out all the rules, the do's and the don'ts, and you'll have to watch last week's sermon. I understand you were in Colorado. You'll have to watch it uh, on the Internet or I make you a DVD. So you can see that we, we want to have some rules, but we don't want to be restrictive in our rules to where the mind of Christ is frustrated. So, Tim, will you just kind of watch the crowd today? And if you see anything going on, you might go and tap somebody on the shoulder. I already did it for a little boy. Right when the music started, I saw a little boy go out. And I so I stopped him at the door. I said, where are you going? He said, to the bathroom. I go, oh. Well, from now on, go to the bathroom before church starts, okay? And and, uh, he's still here. Didn't get mad and take off, get in his dad's car and take off. He didn't do that, so I think we're okay. But will you kind of keep an eye on things? But remember, do's and don'ts. We had our minds stretched because sometimes we think it's going to be easier if we just make a list of do's and don'ts. But sometimes it doesn't make it easier. It makes it harder. I've always believed this. Don't make a rule unless you're willing to enforce that rule. Okay? All right. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, Tim. Let's give it up for Tim Ouellette. All right. Lovely young couple we saw up here. A couple who are not afraid to display their affections publicly. Now, in my day, I was at church and I was playing the piano. My wife was playing flute. And then we got done with the worship team. We were just young people with little babies running around. We got off the platform. We went and sat down. And I put my arm around my wife. Now, there was a woman in her 90s sitting next to her daughter in her 70s. And she said, kind of loud, because sometimes older people do that. They don't know everybody's hearing them. Why has that piano player got his arm around the flute player? And her daughter says, well, mother, they're married. And she said, well, I should hope so. (laughs) Hallelujah. Don't go too far, Brother Bob. All right. I want to ask, I've already asked permission for a couple boys to come up. Jesse and Isaac. I promised them I would not embarrass them. And that means I'm not going to make them sing for you. All right. Isaac Willette, he's Tim's grandson, uh, Brandon and Heidi's son. And then this is Jesse. He's Josh and Megan's son. And I know Shirley, Shirley's grandson. Um, These two boys are going to go to the top of that mountain. On Thursday morning, we're going to get up bright and early, and we are going to walk up to where Dan and Sarissa hiked last week. Last Sunday morning, they got up. They skipped church, people, but with an excused absence. It was marriage time, and they took a two-hour hike. Boys, you and me, along with Peter Knapp, we're going to hike up there. I asked if it's cold up there. I said, no, not not really. It's not cold. A little chilly, but not cold. It's going to be a two-hour hike, maybe longer. Are you up for it? Okay, before we go to camp, let's give it up for Jesse West and Isaac Willette. Thanks, boys. That's on Thursday morning when I take the boys to camp. This afternoon at 2.30, there's a prayer meeting out in our parking lot. It won't, at what time? 3.30. It won't be at 4.30. It'll be at 3.30 because we're going to be sending off the people that are going to the the older kids camp. Okay? So if you would want to show up for prayer, come at 3.30. Okay, here's a list. Tim, um, you weren't here until you watched the DVD. I'm not going to ask you any trick questions, but you know the Christian life is as simple as checking off a list, right? Okay, and the point was, no, nah, not, not really as, as simple as that. And we don't always solve our problems by making up lists, but lists kind of help us to gauge where we are. The bottom line that we do want to check off is a softened heart, a moldable heart, a responsive heart, To God's message through Paul, let us not become conceited. That means thinking more highly of yourself than you ought. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. Provoking means teasing, picking at, maybe being rude to, bullying, talking behind somebody's back, provoking and envy 
Some might think, oh, I'm not envious of anybody else, but apparently it's a problem sometimes in the church because this is an us verse. With that in mind, we're stretching our mind today as we want to tune up the heart strings at Bell Road Baptist Church. Tuning the heart strings, not throwing our mind out, not saying, well, last week we had a nice little message, let's forget it. No, we can't forget it. If you take music lessons, you have to build off the lesson from the week before. Any good teacher will say, until you master last week's lesson, you're wasting your parents' money. I don't really want to see you until you've actually practiced because I don't want to waste my time or your time or your parents' money. So we're going to build off of last week. We're going to use our mind and we're going to tune up our hearts. And right here you see a four-string heart. There's only four there. Bass, tenor, alto, soprano. I don't like these newfangled choirs where they add a fifth down below the basses. Sub-audio. You know what sub-audio is? You can't hear it. The whales might hear it. Some animal might hear it. God hears it. But it's so low you can't hear it. And then there's, you know, the ultra high above the 15,000, 17,000, 20,000. You get up high enough and nobody here would be able to hear it. But the dogs might go, ah! when some of you sing. Because you are his sons, Galatians 4, 6 says, because you are his sons, God sent his son. Reminds me of a song. God sent his son. They called him. Right, we got it. I don't know if that's where they got this verse from, or that song verse but this says God sent his son. But how did he send his son? God sent his son into our hearts. How? Through the vehicle of the Holy Spirit. Through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. God sent his son into our hearts. When you ask Jesus into your heart, that is a ministry of the Holy Spirit. God sends his son into your heart. He sends the Spirit, capital S, the Spirit of his son into our hearts. And the Holy Spirit is not an it. Now I will forgive you when I hear you praying sometimes or I hear you talking and you talk, oh man, the Holy Spirit, it was really moving. The Holy Spirit is not an it. He is God. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out. The Spirit who calls out A-B-B-A, 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 A-B-A, A-B-B-A, A-B-B-A. Can you sing that with me? But that's not a musical term there. <laughs> that's a baby's cry. Abba. Abba. Or Abba. 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 My little grandson is not yet talking. He's still using sign language. He can say more. And he can, eh! he, gets a, he gets an awful lot across when he's frustrated. Eh! If he doesn't want to do something, he uses facial expressions and body language. But when he sees me coming, you know what he says? Baba. Baba. When he sees my car, Baba. When he sees a video, a DVD, his favorite TV, we allow TV in his life when it's a DVD of Bell Road Baptist Church. Baba. Baba. He gets really excited. Baba. But Baba could just as easily be Abba. It's a baby's call. He sent his son to live in our heart. And there is a call that lets us all know that we've been born again. 
It's when there's a cry of your heart, blessed by the Holy Spirit living in you, that you have one you can depend upon. His name is your Abba. He's your daddy. He's your papa. He's your opa. He's your father. You trust him. You can rely on him. And it's something that every born-again Christian has in common. Now, you may have never used the term Abba. But you might try it sometime when you walk up onto a mountaintop. You might want to call out upon God and say, Oh, Heavenly Father, I come to you now in sackcloth and ashes. I beseech thee, O Holy One, We can talk to God like a little child reaching out for one who loves him unconditionally. You can talk to God as one who loves you, dear daughter of God. Like one who believes that he loves you and he wants to pick you up and put you on his shoulders. It's perfect. A perfect relationship. When we ask Jesus Christ into our lives, when we repent of our sins, we admit that we're sinners and we confess that our works are but filthy rags. However we say it, even in a little five-year-old's language, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. I want to live for you. I don't want to go to hell when I die. I know what it is to sin. I want you to be my Lord. Whether it's a child getting saved or a college-educated, senior getting saved. This is a perfect relationship with God because it's his work. You might have called out on him, but if he saved you, it happened because he sent his spirit to live in you. And the call of the spirit is Abba. It's like the first words out of your mouth, Abba. John wrote, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light and he is in the light, we have fellowship with... We have fellowship with one another. Okay? If we walk in the light, Abba... As he is in the light, Abba. If we are in tune with the Father through the Son, by the Spirit whom he sent, if we have that kind of vertical relationship and it's in tune, it's dead center, 12 o'clock. If we have fellowship with him, then we have fellowship with one another. And that fellowship is fellowship of the saved. You cannot have fellowship with darkness. You can be in the world, but you are not of the world. You've been taken out of the world. You have been grafted into the vine. You have a vertical relationship that is absolutely perfect because it doesn't depend upon you. Your relationship is something he took responsibility for. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 1 that he has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing the redemption that is to come. If I'm having trouble with you, if you're having trouble with me or with somebody sitting next to you, you probably ought to look to see if you're in tune. First things first, don't try to solve all this stuff with other sinners if this isn't straight. Get this straight first. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. From Bell Road Laboratories, we have the Holy Ghost tuner. Now, on my guitar, the tuner is clipped on the head of the guitar. On John's, 
his tuner's down here. He can look at something. There's a gauge just like this, and he can tell whether he's in tune. And that guitar tuner is set at the standard of A, 440. That's 440 cycles per second, or in scientific terms, 440 hertz, HZ. If you are to the left of zero, you're not at 440. You might be at 438. And an untrained ear won't hear the difference. And if this A is set for 438, because there's no perfect tuner available, the ear might say, well, I've got near perfect pitch. That's an A438 or 439. It's close. It's good enough for jazz. I can tune the rest of my guitar to the standard of 438, and I can play you a song, and it'll sound good. But if another guitarist has had his guitar sitting in the attic or in the car and temperature has changed the guitar and he's tuned it up by ear. He might have a very good ear and he's been playing songs for the last week at camp and everybody, nobody's complaining, everybody's in tune. But when these two guitarists get together, it will clash. It will not be in unison, let alone harmony. Here's the science. John, I've asked you permission in advance. Will you go find a 440A? Now, I know middle C is 261 point something, something, something. But A440, nice, clean, even number. A440. Could you do that with me? Could you do it again? This is a test of the emergency broadcast system. Okay, now we're going to exactly double that mathematical sine wave. We're going to make it 880 hertz, 880 cycles, 880 vibrations per second. And I want you to listen to an 880. Now hit the 440 at the same time. Hit the 440 by itself. Hit the 880. That's called an octave. An octave has to do with doubling or subtracting exactly by half. Okay, thanks, John. Then there's 1320 and 1760 and 2640, and I don't know what pitches those are on the piano, but you know that between a C and a C sharp, there are six discernible tones. If you were tested in a hearing clinic and they would ask, is the first tone higher? or lower than the second tone, you ought to, if you've got good hearing, you ought to be able to point up or point down, higher or lower, six times between a C and a C sharp. And that's why music outside our Western box, the 12-tone scale of our piano, that's why sometimes music sounds very strange to our ears if it's played on string instruments or flutes that aren't locked to the box of the 12-tone scale. Now, pitch on a guitar involves strings of equal length. All these strings, they, they're from here to here. They're all exactly the same length. What changes the pitch of these six strings is the tension placed upon the individual string. It's not how thick the string is that changes the pitch. It's the tension. And that's why we do these tuners. And if you want to have a lot of fun, I could just tune it up, tune it up, tune it up, and then snap! But John wouldn't like that. And that would be a fun object lesson, but we will skip that for now. But this relationship at the um, fifth fret is three-fourths. When you push your finger down, you're making the string effectively shorter. So the pitch is higher. It's the same as moving it up, twisting the knob. It's a three-quarter relationship. If you go up to the seventh fret, it is two-thirds. And they are pleasing tones. And we've built all of our theory in our hymnals. 
And all the songs that the people are singing, whether they're good at math or not, they're doing the math that has been passed down to us by the mathematician Pythagoras, the father of our Western musical scale. There's an A, 440. You heard it, right? Now, I asked for a volunteer. Bob Knapp, are you here? Hey, Bob, I want you to come stand right here. Boy, that's kind of high, a 440. Would you give us a 220, John, run? Uh, he's running with permission, just like the kids that skipped church last week. It was excused absence. Okay. Um, Could you do that? Uh, no. Uh, 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 okay. Um, now, Diane, I see why you haven't worked real hard at recruiting him. <laughs> You know, brother, maybe we should try something else. Like maybe, have you ever thought about building for a career? Yeah. Um, but you know what? Bless his heart. If he wanted to join the choir, all he'd need to have is a good, strong singer next to him. Could I get somebody, a volunteer, somebody that sung in the choir in the bass section before that could hit a 220, you think? Kurt? Someone volunteered you, Kurt. Do I have a second? All in favor of Kurt coming up, clap your hands. All right. All right, let's hear that 220 again. Oh, you got it, Kurt. Come right up here and sing next to Bob so Bob can sing with you. Oh, and you know when I'm vibrating, oh, that might sound pretty years, but it's not perfection. When we get older, sometimes our vibrato gets very flappy because our vocal cords are flapping all over. So you've heard the person. Ah, that's not a perfect tone. It's like. Ah. So let's do a nice clear. Ah. Good. You're, you're doing a little vibrato. Don't do the vibrato. Straight, straighten it up. Ah. Okay, good. Next. We need an 880. I got a 220. Let's have an 880. Diana, can you hit that note? Or would you rather have a... Yeah, come right next to them. So you're two octaves ahead of them. You're, you're, you're hitting an 880? Yeah, hit it. That's like the last note of the Christmas finale. Okay, together. Okay, good, 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 good. Now there's an E. Hit the E. Um, just hit any E. But mm, I need an alto. Come on up here. Sarissa, would you come on up? Can she hit that? Uh, okay. Hit that E. Give her the E. Okay, you hit your notes. 220. Okay, and then we need a C sharp. I'll just do that for simplicity's sake. Let's let's hear the 220. Everybody sing the 220. Good. Have a seat. That's called harmony. And it's because we had a standard. Here's the standard. We've stretched the mind because we've read God's word. This is a New Testament. Here's hope. Jesus cares for you. We've stretched the mind. Now we want to tune up the heartstrings of Bell Road Baptist Church, knowing, folks, that we have to have some rules. There has to be some do's and don'ts. But those do's and don'ts are the ones that we agree upon together. It's not somebody setting themselves up as law writer and as law keeper. If Tim, for instance, is going to try to bring order to God's house on a Sunday morning, he's got a whole bunch of people who, who can't sing and pitch, don't even know music, can't carry a tune in a bucket, don't understand that there's something wrong with getting up, going outside, getting up, talking in the hallway during the sermon. There's people that have come from all kinds of backgrounds. And if Tim is going to be in law enforcement, it has to be in tune with the standard that we've agreed upon. God has given us the power in the local church to bind and to loose, to allow some things to go by. 
I'm not the only one in a suit today. I prayed for a man yesterday that when I see him at church, he usually has a suit on. And guess what? He's here today wearing a suit. I was so blessed when I saw him come in. Not because I like seeing suits on people on Sunday morning. I like seeing the person in the suit. And I see this is my gym clothes. And it gets kind of raggy, but hey, I'm not there for show. I'm there to work out and to read God's word. Basically is what I'm doing. Working out, and I'm just working out the legs and the heart. You know, I don't care about upper body strength all that much. I'm just working out, getting the heart pumping. And I'm sitting there reading the Bible. I mean, standing there on the elliptical, reading the Bible, doing this, doing this. And then I, I drank up all my liquid, and I went to go get a refill. And these two guys who were two ellipticals down from me said, uh, when they saw this, they go, oh, <laughs> root beer. I go, no, it's water. And he goes, well, I thought, wow, where did he get the beer? He thought I was drinking beer while I was doing this. And I, and I pointed to my shirt. I said, well, I'm, I'm Bell Row Baptist Church. I'm glad that, you know, they clarified. This is just water in here. Just water. Do's and don'ts, getting in tune with each other, representing one another. The, the covenantal statement did not get changed from last week either. It still says, I will support the testimony of my church by attending faithfully. And that's not just showing up with your body. That's standing up if the song leader says stand. You know, would you stand with me? If at all possible, you're attending faithfully. That's listening. If someone says, uh, you know, will you finish the sentence for me? Attendance would mean paying attention, being here with your mind, with your heart, with your strength. Using whatever God's given you to help get the point across to the people of God. So John used the strength to run up to the piano, hit the notes. These ones that came to participate used the vigor of their youth, used their minds to share the heart, to get the heart strings in tune. I will support the testimony. I will support the testimony of my church by attending faithfully, by living a godly life, by giving regularly. More important, I mean, it wouldn't have, I don't know if it would have been against the law to drink beer there or not. It, may, it might be in the rules. No beer while you're exercising. But, but for water, against such there is no law. You can drink as much water as you want. I try to go through like five of these while I'm 5, 20 ounces, 100 ounces while I'm working out, if it's possible. But if I took those boys to camp without rules, what would, what would happen? Without any rules? You know what they gave me? Before I would go to camp, I had to sign off. All this stuff, like 25 rules. I had not just check, I had to write my initials. And I was told, and all of the boys have gone through this with their parents and signed off. And so I'm thinking, golly, I'm the law enforcer in this case, but the beauty of this is all four of us have agreed these are going to be the rules for us. There's no leaving the camp once camp has started until camp is over. I'm taking them up on the mountain, but I'm not ditching afternoon activities on Friday. No, no. I'm taking them up on the mountain early Thursday morning before camp begins. I'm not in violation of the rules. But we're going to continue to have to discuss rules for the care of our carpet, for the maintenance of our driveway, parking lot, for the repair of our roof. There's going to have to be rules. I'd want the mind to be stretched and the heartstrings, all the different hearts involved in Bell Road, to come together to share one heart with Christ. So here's 1 Corinthians 13 at Bell Road Labs. They sang it for us today, Dan and Sarissa. Love never fails. Take a close look at that photograph. See what that heart's made out of? Two fish hooks. I was looking for a picture of having your heart tugged at. In one of the pictures on the internet I found, it wasn't good enough to display, but if somebody had Photoshop and would put it together for me, I would like to take our um, heart and have a fish hook in it and have the heart just being stretched a little bit, tugged at by the fish hook. 
to represent Jesus, the fisher of men, hooking our heart and tugging at us. Your heart can be poked at. Your heart can be prodded. The Apostle Paul is asked, Why, Saul, do you kick against the goads? You know, the the stick that you'd poke the oxen with to get them to go in in a direction. God will sometimes poke us to get us in a direction. But I like to think about the tug at my heart. If the Lord is tugging at my heart, so every time I would pray with people who were saying, Lord, will you bless Will you bless the camp this year? We still need to have some men counselors. We need to have somebody take the boys. We could throw them into a cabin with some other church, but we'd rather send somebody from our church. My heart was being tugged at. So I was able to tell the parents, I've really prayed about this. I'm not just going because nobody else will. I'm going because I prayed about it. And I'm going to purpose to follow the rules and to give those boys the, a very safe and spiritual retreat. That they'll come home, maybe not men, but more mature as boys. Love never fails. That tuner. Dead center, see that? Love never fails. Love. See, that's wavering. That's wavering. Love, love, love. No wavering? You get it right up on pitch? Ask yourself when somebody bothers you in the church, Lord, do you love this person? The answer is going to come back, yes, because God is love. Then, Lord, Show me how to love this person with the love you have for him or her. That'll help you get tuned up. You might not be perfect, and you might go through the rest of your life never really being able to really fully get connected with God's love for that individual or for that group of people. You just might struggle and struggle, but if you are making the effort, if you are praying about this matter of vertical relationship. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I believe the Lord will be pleased with that. Now, I don't know this fellow. I just found him on the Internet. I was looking for some images and stuff, and I found this guy's blog. And he was talking about a friend of his who had written and compared the heart strings to a guitar. Comparing the heart to a guitar. And it wasn't the kind of thing I was going after today, but I liked what he had to say. I find it interesting, Roger writes, I find it interesting that many guitarists, myself included, seem to stop learning after a while. Like we're happy with the set number of chords and songs we can play. And we settle into a rhythm of predictability. It's like, I'm good enough for now. And then there are others who go on to discover alternate tunings and jazz chords and what playing in a duet is like and perhaps a band and maybe going on to record or even playing next to the campfire, singing the heart out. Using your guitar on a big stage with a full orchestra, Carnegie Hall, might be different than using your guitar to lead a group of people, some in suits and some in dress casual and some in dirty gym clothes. But using the guitar around a campfire, there's something really earthy about your willingness to take your instrument around a campfire. There's something about that that reminds me of David sitting out on a hillside watching Jesse's sheep strumming on his guitar. Check this out. I did a little funeral yesterday, and I used this song. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the road 
the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God is calling, and He walks with me, and He talks with me, and He tells. His own. Now watch this. And the joy we share as we tear. None other has ever known. So what I did was throw in that diminished chord, you know, the climb up. It's not in the hymnal, it's not in the music, it's just like some jazz chords. I just threw it in, but it makes it kind of fun to sing, but it wasn't out of place at this unchurched crowd, a memorial service for a grandma that passed away in March. So I want you to be among the others. The others who go on to discover alternate tunings. You might not realize what this guy is doing with these things. They're called capos. And they're like imitation fingers that stick across the neck. And he's using two of them. They're innovations. He probably picked it up at YouTube or something. Alternate tunings and two capos to, to cause different tension points on the strings. A lot of thought is going in to our music. And I, for one, am pleased that we have a worship team who's going on to discover alternate tunings, jazz chords, what playing in a duet is like. Did you know that history was made here this morning? We've all heard Sarissa sing. She's singing beautifully these days. She's young. The vibrato is kind of in tune. It's not all over the place. But when you, you add 30 years to that, I'm going to be teasing you, Sarissa. Come on, Sarissa. Uh, Sarissa, can you kind of pull down the vibrato a little bit? Oh, really? Yes. Just, just tighten it up a little, girl. But you, you see what happened today? History was made. She's been singing up here, you know, every few weeks with the worship team. But you'd never once seen her husband sing. And I do believe that that's maybe the second or third time that he's ever gotten up that up front center. He sung in children's choir. <laughs> he sung with his daddy in the car, but now he's singing with his wife. That's a duet. We heard men's quartet, didn't we? We've heard ladies from a family, multi-generational, singing a cappella. You're going to hear a women's quartet coming up here soon. You're going to hear flute and piano playing together. You're going to hear a, a banjo, a guitar, and a voice. Two men and a woman. And then and we're going to have a talent show on a Sunday night in August. What's the date of that? August 28th. We'll come back from special ministries camp, and we have to have something planned to do. I'll probably invite some special ministries folks from other churches to come for our talent show to do our special at the talent show. There's nothing wrong with a talent show because if God gave you five talents, the best ending to the story is that you invested all five, you earned five more. That means if you got a choir of five and you double the choir, God will even take one from a church that dropped choir and add it to your choir. Now you got a choir of 11. The altar is open. I'm going to ask the men and women who believe in power of prayer to come forward to be willing to pray with you. The Bible says in James chapter 5, if anybody's in trouble, you should pray. These men and women are learning how to pray. They're not perfect at praying, but with practice comes perfection. And we're going to be practicing this matter of praying in the church until each one of us, till our number is called, till God calls us on the roll up yonder. The Bible goes on to say, 
In James chapter 5, that if anybody's happy, you should sing a song of praise. And the song we are going to sing for a closing hymn today is a song that Billy Graham, and uh, what's that guy's name that went with him, the singer? George Beverly Shea. They teamed up, two people. It's like a spiritual duet. Billy Graham would preach, and George Beverly Shea would sing this song, along with a choir of hundreds that would join up in every city. If, if you're happy, sing a song of praise. And if you're sick, call upon the elders of the church. Let's bring the lights down, please. And if you are able to stand, would you stand for a song of invitation? If you have not asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, come just as you are. I will stand down here ready to receive anybody who would like to come to be saved.
I got my brother Anthony with me, Anthony Figarelli. How old are you, Anthony? 30 years old. Okay, well, Anthony's been coming to our church, and I think you live in a group home. Is that right? In the neighborhood, you walk to church? Last week, Anthony talked almost all the way through the service. But you know what? He was tracking with the sermon. And I was listening to the video because the only sound we had was from Christy's camera. And this guy was listening to the whole sermon all the way through and was just responding to the preaching. And there were some around him thinking he was talking too loud. And one was praying, Lord, should I go up and talk to him? Another one was praying, Lord, will you help me to deal with this? But God just allowed him to talk during the whole service. Now, I asked him before I preached today, I asked Anthony, um, because of the camera and stuff, will you not talk during the sermon? Did anybody hear Anthony talking during the sermon today? You know what that is? That's self-control. And that's that's, uh, submission to authority. So I just want to celebrate my friendship with Anthony that I could ask that of him. Would you pray with me and Anthony? Let's bow our heads together. Lord, we bow our heads, symbolizing the bowing of our hearts before you. We surrender to you all our wishes, all our wants, all our needs. Lord, some of us uh, are seeking religious freedom. Some are seeking financial freedom. Some are seeking spiritual freedom from bondages. Lord, we pray that you will bless us to be free Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So bless us to tap in to the Holy Spirit living within us. To come to read your word and let every time the Holy Spirit shows up in your word, to let it just pop out on the page. That we'll know we're talking about God, the very Spirit of Jesus, the Son of God living in us. We ask you, Lord, Holy Spirit, we ask you to convict us of righteousness Convict us of our sins and lead us to Jesus. For it is in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit we pray. Let the church say amen. Amen. Shake hands with one another and be friends. God bless you.